So we're back with another reading, another pranic reading as we've been proceeding. <laughs> Season's greetings with the pranic living unveiled. We're telling the story, reciting the tale of pranic living unveiled, the new way of nourishment. And last time we went through some chapters. So today we're going to go through some more as we explore huh, and see what's in store for us on the pranic path, the questions that are asked, moving much further past to see what will last. Welcome back to the class. <laughs> Thank you just for joining. Thank you just for being. And thank you for seeing with a feeling so free. We're back with the pranic pages. And let's continue to find out what shines bright within you. So today, we'll start on the chapter called The Compensation of Consumption. It starts with a quote from my good friend Albina Veniaminova. Shout out to Albina. Albina says, food is compensation for the feelings that you are missing. And sometimes your brain can't even analyze what it is you are missing. It just knows that it will receive that feeling five seconds during when the food is in your mouth. We are eating emotions. We do not eat food. Food doesn't really do anything to us besides give us emotions, and that is the truth of consumption. Albina Venya Minova. Life is a series of fleeting moments where we experience the full spectrum of emotions, from joy and elation to sorrow and despair. The lesson to be learned, however, is that these emotions, no matter how intense, are impermanent. They are like waves crashing onto the shore, powerful in the moment, but destined to recede into the vast ocean. Understanding this impermanence is crucial, especially on the pranic journey, where you're navigating through not just physical changes, but profound emotional and spiritual shifts. The roller coaster metaphor illustrates this perfectly. Emotions rise and fall. Circumstances change. And what feels overwhelming today may be but a distant memory tomorrow. The key is to stay grounded and embrace the ride with the knowledge that nothing lasts forever. This perspective became particularly clear to me during a 10-day Vipassana retreat in Lava Hot Springs, Idaho. Imagine this, 30 of us sitting in silence, wrapped in layers of blankets, meditating for 10 hours each day while the snow fell outside. The cold was biting and the hours seemed endless. Not everyone made it through the entire 10 days. Some participants expressed feeling intense physical discover discomfort during the meditations, while others experienced blissful euphoria. The meditation teacher responded to both extremes in the same way. This too shall pass. This phrase, simple yet profound, applies to all aspects of life, whether you are enduring a difficult phase or basking in a moment of triumph. It is essential to remember that both are temporary. The storms will pass, and so too will the sunshine. What matters is how we navigate these waves with grace, resilience, and a deep understanding that we have the strength to endure whatever comes our way. On the pranic journey, the ups and downs are inevitable. Detox symptoms, food withdrawals, and the resurfacing of old traumas are all a part of the process. 
when you decide to forego solid food, especially when you've used food as a means of emotional comfort, you strip away a layer of security. This can leave you feeling exposed, vulnerable, and perhaps even afraid. But it's precisely in this vulnerability that the real work begins. This is where shadow work comes in, a term often used in spiritual circles to describe the process of confronting and integrating the darker, hidden aspects of ourselves. You ever done shadow work? Our shadows are composed of the parts of ourselves that we have repressed, denied, or ignored. These could be feelings of guilt, feelings of shame, fear, or anger. When we no longer have the comfort of food to pacify these emotions, they come to the surface, demanding our attention. Facing your shadow is not always easy. It requires courage to look at the parts of yourself that you've tried to keep, keep hidden, to acknowledge the pain and trauma you have buried deep within. But as daunting as it may seem, this confrontation is essential for true healing and growth. By shining a light on your shadow, you can begin to understand the root causes of your pain, and in doing so, start the process of healing. The beauty of this journey is that it teaches you to trust yourself, to realize that you are more resourceful and resilient than you ever imagined. The discomfort you feel, whether physical or emotional, is not a sign of weakness, but a sign that you are on the verge of a breakthrough. If you can endure the discomfort and resist the urge to retreat back into old habits, you will discover a strength within you that is unshakable. This journey is not just about eliminating food or changing your diet. It is about transforming your entire way of being. It is about shedding the layers of conditioning that have kept you bound to old patterns and embracing a new way of living that is rooted in freedom, clarity, and self-awareness. Remember, you are not alone on this journey. Many have walked this path before you, and many will walk it after you. The challenges you face are universal, and the insights you gain will serve as a beacon of light for others who are on a similar path. Trust in the process, trust in yourself, and know that every step you take is bringing you closer to the life you were meant to live. So as you continue on your pranic journey, hold on to the knowledge that every high and every low is part of a grand tapestry of your life. The grand tapestry of your life. Embrace each moment knowing that it will pass and take comfort in the fact that you have the power within you to weather any storm. In the end, it is not the external circumstances that define your life, but how you choose to respond that will take you beyond. Next, we have a quote from Hazrat Inyat Khan. It is not solid wood that can become a flute, but the empty reed. The Sound of Music Our bodies, much like instruments, are more than just physical entities. They are vessels for something far greater. The potential of our bodies to resonate and create harmony with the universe becomes very apparent through the practice of pranic living. It is a journey that aligns us with the essence of life itself allowing us to become attuned to a higher frequency and ultimately to the divine. Sounds too esoteric? <laughs> Let's explore this idea a bit more deeply. Consider fasting, a core element of pranic living, as a way of emptying our bodies 
much like the reed of a flute, is emptied to produce sound. When we fast, we are not simply depriving ourselves of food. We are cleansing our bodies of impurities and distractions. This emptiness, this void, is what allows us to become a conduit for something greater. It is in this space of nothingness that we find everything. The concept that the mother of all creation is relaxation speaks to this truth. In the relaxed state that fasting and pranic practices bring, we are not fighting against the natural flow of life, but moving with it in harmony. Just as a harp's strings must be attuned and plucked with precision, our bodies, when cleared of the excess, become finely attuned instruments capable of resonating with the purest of frequencies. The result is a state of being that is not only revitalized and renewed, but also is in perfect synchrony with the source of all light. I just love that bird chirping. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful theme for the chapter. Imagine the power of this transformation. Our energy, subtle yet potent, becomes palpable to those around us. Like if you've ever heard someone say, I feel you. Man, I feel you. With heightened sensitivity, others can perceive our frequency and our vibration. This energy can be so refined that it communicates even before words are spoken, before you even walk into a room. You ever felt that? Like when you're around somebody or when you see somebody for the first time and it's like their energy speaks before their mouth even opens, before they even speak a word, you've already felt their energy. You ever felt that? <laughs> drop, a, drop a like if you felt that. We are all musicians in this symphony of life. Each of us is playing our unique tune. Yet there is a big difference between the resonance of a master and that of an amateur. The master saxophonist with years of practice and deep connection to their instrument produces a melody that is rich, full, and capable of moving the soul. The amateur still learning to connect with their instrument may produce sound, but it lacks the depth and harmony that comes from true mastery. In the same way, by tuning our energy through pranic practices, we begin to shift our frequency. This process of attunement affects not just us, but everyone and everything that we interact with. People can sense whether we are dense, weighed down by impurities and unaddressed issues, or whether we are clear channels, vibrating at a higher frequency. This is why you might find certain people are drawn to you. Or conversely, why some people seem repelled. Your frequency is always communicating, even at a subconscious level. And it influences the reality you experience. This concept is beautifully demonstrated through the study of cymatics, which explores how sound impacts physical matter. Through cymatics, we witness how sound waves create intricate sacred geometrical patterns in materials such as sand or water. It's, it's amazing when you've seen this. Just type in cymatics on YouTube. C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S, cymatics. It's, it's amazing what sound can do. And since our bodies are composed primarily of water, it's not a stretch to imagine that these same patterns are being formed within us. The music we listen to, the people we interact with, and even our thoughts all have the potential to shape these patterns, affecting our overall health, mood, and energy. When you spend time with other breatharians, 
or pranic practitioners, you may notice a shift within yourself. Their energy, which has been refined through years of practice and commitment, has a tangible impact on those around them. This phenomenon can be likened to an energetic attunement. Being in their presence begins to harmonize your own energy, raising your frequency and aligning you more closely with the pranic path. This is why it is often said, be careful of the company you keep. The people you surround yourself with can either elevate you or bring you down depending on the resonance of their energy. By aligning yourself with those who have dedicated themselves to this path, you are more likely to stay attuned to the practices and principles that will keep you vibrating at a higher frequency. The pranic journey is one of continuous refinement, an ongoing process of tuning your instrument, so to speak. As you progress, you'll find that your energy not only transforms you, but also has the power to transform the world around you. Through this process, you will discover that you are more than just a body. You are a living, breathing instrument of the divine, capable of creating harmony in your life and in the lives of others. So continue to cultivate your energy, fine tune your frequency, and surround yourself with those who resonate with your highest self. In doing so, you'll find that your life becomes a more beautiful symphony, echoing the music of the universe. And it reminds me of something I put up on threads today. I put up a quote on threads. I was just saying that we can rise higher when we remove our limiting beliefs. And we can rise even higher when we surround ourselves with others who have removed their limiting beliefs. So there's even more buoyancy and more enlightenment. You become even lighter when you're around other people that have stripped away the layers of their own limiting beliefs, their own doubts, their own disbelief, their own worries, their own stress, their own frustrations, their own confrontation with what we battle in the mind the lack of conviction the lack of, the lack of self-worthiness the self-image the self-esteem the self-confidence when you get around people who think of themselves highly who believe in themselves highly who know that they have an inner assurance an inner guidance an inner knowing that is always growing that is always glowing wherever they're going when this energy is flowing not only in you, but in those around you. Just wait for the synchronicities that have found you. <laughs> Just wait in no time, right? Things start to change in no time because you're in no time. And blessings might come out of nowhere, right? So the chapter ends on... A quote by Noah Lakshmi. Shout out to my friend Noah. Blessings to you. Noah says, Just knowing that there's something here I am for, like an instrument that is meant to be played a certain way and hasn't been played yet, like there's a particular song or a particular harmony that is meant to be transmuted. Noah Lakshmi. The guilt of not giving. Here's a quote by Ellie Tom Elamine. You don't even have to use that word supernatural. This is something you can develop into. Well, of course, it is supernatural. Yeah, I am supernatural. I'm around people, they're all eating, and I'm just sitting there looking at them. Right, that's supernatural. Grunting and falling out all over the place, I'm just looking at them. Pretty soon, they got to go take a nap. They got to go lie down. And I'm just running all over the place. Yeah, I am a supernatural being. You sleep less, you get a lot more done. You have a lot more energy. You're healthier, you're stronger. You're developing into a supernatural being by strengthening your electrical system. 
Elitam Elamim. As I've been writing this book, I've found myself in various cafes, coffee shops, and nearby restaurants. I'll occasionally be sipping on juice while everyone around me indulges in large portions of food. Surprisingly, this environment, steeped in the aroma of meals being prepared and consumed, has become a wellspring of inspiration for my writing. There's something profound about sitting amidst the very thing I have chosen to abstain from. It is akin to a person who fears flying, but deliberately watches planes take off, gradually conditioning themselves to the idea. In a similar vein, being around others who are eating while I am not eating helps me acclimate to the concept of abstaining. It is like Jedi training, <laughs> an exercise in self-discipline and a test of my resolve. With each sip of juice, I reinforce my commitment to this path, drawing strength from the challenge that the environment presents. Between chapters, I often take breaks to meditate, grounding myself amidst the sensory overload of bustling eateries. These moments of introspection are occasionally interrupted by the kindness of strangers. They approach me with offerings of food from their tables. This happened many times. <laughs> their gestures filled with concern and perhaps a bit of confusion. Despite having a cell phone, a wireless keyboard, and clearly not appearing homeless, I am met with offers of food. Their voices carry a note of hesitation, almost as if they are unsure whether or not they are being considerate or intrusive. It is a curious thing, this unease that people seem to feel when they see someone sitting in a restaurant without eating. It is as if my mere presence, my refusal to partake, disrupts the natural order of things. I become an anomaly, an oddity in their eyes. Someone who defies the unspoken rule that to be in a restaurant is to eat. This reaction is not limited to strangers in public spaces. When I've stayed with friends, it often takes them a few days to adjust to my lifestyle. It is almost amusing, really because there's nothing for them to adjust to, aside from their own preconceived notions about what the body needs to function. My friends, like most people, have been conditioned to believe that food is essential, that to live as I do would be an act of self-deprivation, even self-harm. They project their fears onto me, assuming that I must be starving, suffering, or at the very least, missing out on something vital. Their love for me manifests in their insistence that I eat and in their worried glances and raised eyebrows as I politely decline. I've lost count of how many times I've heard them say, man, I feel so guilty eating this in front of you. Are you sure you can't have this? You sure? I reassure them calmly, explaining that I can have anything I want. I simply choose not to. Over time, I've developed a repertoire of ways to say no to food. Sometimes I'll accept an offer only to pass the food along to someone else who might need it more. It's my way of ensuring that the energy behind the gesture is honored and that the universe's abundance continues to flow. Other times, I'll tell people I'm on a special diet or that I'm fasting. Fasting, after all, is a concept most people can grasp, as it is rooted in religious and cultural practices all across the world. I've even taken to telling people that I'm just taking a break and I will eat eventually. This usually satisfies their curiosity, though it often leads to a follow-up question the very next day. You ready to eat now? <laughs> I'll smile and say, maybe tomorrow. A response that buys me time until they eventually stop asking. This dance around food isn't new to me. During my 10-day Vipassana retreat, I faced a similar challenge. The retreat center had strict guidelines prohibiting fasting, likely out of concern that the combination of intense meditation and fasting 
might be too much for some participants. To navigate this, I simply removed my silverware from the table, <clears throat> allowing the staff to assume that I was eating the prepared meals. Looking back, it is almost humorous how not eating became my secret to surviving that retreat. My body had become so accustomed to life without solid food that I doubt I would have made it past the first day if I had started eating again. Yet these experiences bring to light a deeper issue, the guilt that surrounds food. Or more specifically, the guilt that arises when someone chooses not to eat. We live in a society where indulgence is the norm, where consuming large quantities of food is not only accepted, but celebrated. But when someone abstains, especially in a social setting, it disrupts the status quo. It raises eyebrows and questions, as if the mere act of not eating is an affront to those who do. Where does this idea come from? This notion that something must be wrong with someone who doesn't eat. I know that my friends and family mean well, that their offers of food come from a place of love, but I shouldn't have to compromise my well-being to ease their discomfort. I don't need to harm my body to make them feel better about their own choices. So I continue to politely decline, trusting in my own path. This phenomenon could be described as a kind of giver's guilt. In some cultures, the refusal of food is seen as the ultimate disrespect, the ultimate, making this dynamic even more complex. It becomes a delicate balancing act. How do you show appreciation for someone's culinary creation while also standing firm in your own practices? How do you navigate the social intricacies of turning down a dish that you might have once considered a favorite? Food in most cultures is more than just a means of survival. It is an essential part of social rituals, a binding force in relationships, and a language of love and care. When people gather around a table, they do more than eat. People use food to connect. They share stories and participate in a communal experience. This is why your choice to abstain from eating in social settings can be so unsettling for others. It disrupts a deeply ingrained social contract. Offering someone a meal is an almost universal gesture of hospitality, kindness, and inclusion. When you turn down that offer, it can feel to others like a rejection not just of the food itself, but of the connection they are trying to establish or maintain. This is where the giver's guilt comes into play. People are so used to equating food with self-care that they struggle to understand how one can express love or kindness in ways that don't involve sharing a meal. The journey into pranic living will place you in a unique position where you must constantly navigate the tension between your personal truth and societal expectations. On one hand, there is your deep commitment to your practice. And on the other hand, there is the social pressure to conform to cultural norms surrounding food. Norms that dictate that eating together is a fundamental part of being together. However, I do see this gradually changing. While in California, even back in 2020, I witnessed pressed juiceries, shops that had no food and only sold juices. I also visited oxygen bars, places where people would actually go to get a sample of different flavors of oxygen. People would sit and breathe in these spaces, like a town bar for breatharians. It was something to witness. The world is slowly structuring itself to accommodate for the change in frequency among the populace. Being on this journey means that you too are a part of that change. The social tension can be most evident in your interactions with friends and family. 
their concern for your well-being, their repeated offers of food, and their expressions of guilt when you decline all stem from a place of love. Yet this love is filtered through a sense or a lens of societal conditioning that equates eating with health, normalcy, and happiness. When you reject their offers, it challenges their understanding of these concepts, creating a dissonance that can be uncomfortable for both parties. What is remarkable is how you handle this dissonance. Rather than succumb to the pressure to conform, you remain steadfast in your practice. You recognize that while their concern is genuine, it is based on a limited perspective that does not fully grasp the depth of your journey. Your ability to navigate these interactions with grace, politely declining offers, reassuring them of your well-being and finding ways to honor their intentions without compromising your path demonstrates a profound inner strength. Just as a person can train their mind to accept a new reality, you are training yourself and perhaps, by example, those around you to see food in a new light. By sitting in cafes, restaurants and other scenes, sipping juice while others eat, you are normalizing the idea of not eating in social settings both for yourself and for others. You are showing that it is possible to engage in social activities, to be present and participatory without conforming to the expectation that eating must be a part of that experience. By choosing not to eat, you are exercising a level of control and autonomy that many people do not even realize they have. This choice is not just about food. It is about how you define your relationship with your body, your spirit, and the world around you. It is about reclaiming the power to decide what goes into your body, and by extension, what energies and influences you allow into your life. This sacred choice also comes with the freedom to redefine what it means to care for yourself and others. You are teaching those around you that true care comes not from adhering and fearing, but from listening to and honoring one's own inner guidance. The idea that not eating can create discomfort or guilt in others touches on a deep and an even deeper spiritual resonance. Food is often tied to survival, and survival instincts are super embedded in the human psyche. When you back up from the table, especially in a public setting, it can trigger subconscious fears in others. Fears of lack, deprivation, and mortality. Your calm demeanor and the clarity with which you explain your choices can help to alleviate these fears, not just in others, but within yourself as well. Overall, your authentic experience invites others to question their own relationship with food their bodies, and their own spiritual practices. It encourages a deeper inquiry into what truly nourishes us, not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. In a world that often equates eating with living, you are a living example of the fact that life, in its truest sense, is much more than the sum of its parts. These questions don't always have easy answers, but they are a part of the journey. A journey that requires not only physical discipline, but emotional resilience. It is about learning to honor your own needs and boundaries while still engaging with the world around you. It is about finding a way to be true to yourself without alienating those you care about. And it is about recognizing that the path you have chosen, though unconventional, is the one that brings you closest to the harmony and the peace that you seek. Ask, and it is given. We begin with a quote from Elitam Melamine. You do replace something when you go into something else. 
I'm having a breatharian experience because I want it to have the experience. Let me see what that feels like. Now, once you're here, I like this feeling. I don't like that other feeling. Ellie Tom Elamine. There's something profoundly humbling about reflecting on the moments that lead us to our present path, especially when those moments feel divinely orchestrated. I have a secret confession to make. I actually prayed for this lifestyle. It was during a time of inner turmoil and longing, right around my first pranic retreat, that I found myself aimlessly wandering the streets of downtown Los Angeles. As if guided by an unseen force, I ended up in Little Tokyo, a small enclave nestled within the bustling city, a place where tradition meets the modern world. In this vibrant district, I stumbled upon a Buddhist temple, almost as if by accident. It was tucked away, hidden by the obvious routes traveled by tourists and hurried pedestrians. But of course, we know the universe does not deal in accidents. What seems like a random turn down an alleyway often leads to the very door we are meant to walk through. As I stood there, watching people enter a seemingly nondescript building, I noticed something peculiar. They weren't just casual visitors. These were people of purpose, speaking in their native tongues, and each one was granted entry only after the door was carefully opened and closed behind them. It was a secret world within the world that I knew. A place of access reserved only for those who belonged or sought something deeply spiritual. Curiosity tugged at me and I approached the door. A monk appeared, his presence calm and commanding, asking, what did I need? I inquired if this was a place where one could meditate or pray seeking sanctuary from the chaos of the outside world. He informed me that the temple was open to visitors, but only on specific days and during a narrow time window. Determined, I returned on the appointed day, and this time I was allowed to cross the threshold. Inside, the air was thick with the incense, the scent of incense, a quiet reverence permeated the atmosphere. The walls were adorned with statues of Buddha and other deities, each one a symbol of peace and enlightenment. The monk guided me to an altar where I could light an incense stick and offer a prayer. And so standing there in the dim light, surrounded by centuries of spiritual energy, I prayed. Can you guess what my prayer was? I prayed to be freed from hunger completely. It was a bold request, one that went against every instinct we are taught about survival. But I was earnest, driven by a desire to transcend the physical needs that seemed to anchor me to this world. As I whispered my prayer, I felt a profound connection. As if my words had not just echoed within the temple walls, but had traveled far beyond, touching something ancient and wise. When I left the temple, I felt different. Though I couldn't quite place the change, there was a sense that my energy had reached out and touched something. Someone, somewhere, had heard me. Fast forward to the pranic retreat. I was sharing a room with other participants, all of us bundled in sleeping bags, the chill of the night keeping us close. Sleep eluded me, and as I finally drifted off into the realm of dreams, I had one of the most vivid, lucid experiences of my life. In this dream, there was a presence, perhaps a voice, that asked me a simple yet profound question. 
Was I ready for my prayer to be answered? Was I truly prepared for the next step in my evolution? With a mixture of fear and resolve, I answered yes. And in that instant, a door appeared before me. I hesitated only for a moment before stepping through the door, heading into this new reality. I awoke abruptly. <gasps> the room still cloaked in silence. Everyone else was still asleep. But I was different. I had crossed over into something new. In the days that followed, I noticed an extraordinary shift. The hunger that I had once been plagued with was gone evaporated as if it had never existed. The cravings that had dictated so much of my life were now mere echoes, faint and powerless. I found myself in a space where I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I could survive indefinitely without food and perhaps even without water if I so chose. It was an experience that defied all logic, yet it was my reality. Whether you believe in the power of prayer or not, there is no denying the profound capabilities of the human mind. Our beliefs shape our reality. We've all heard of the placebo effect where people can heal themselves simply by believing in the efficacy of a sugar pill. The mind can make us well or it can make us sick. It can lead us to extraordinary feats or hold us back in mediocrity. Whatever you earnestly desire, whatever wish you send out into the universe with unwavering belief will manifest in your life. But heed this caution. Be careful what you wish for. My prayer was granted and it changed the course of my life. I'm sharing this with you because we often hesitate to ask for what we truly want out of fear, out of doubt, or a sense of unworthiness. But when you dare to ask, to truly believe in your request, the universe will respond. Just be certain that you are prepared for the answer when it comes, because it's coming. And when it does, it may transform your life in ways you could have never imagined. The future of food freedom. As we stand at the crossroads of unprecedented global challenges, from climate change to food scarcity, the future of how we sustain ourselves is more critical than ever. The pranic lifestyle, which thrives on this idea of living with minimal or no food at all offers a radical yet profound shift in how we approach nourishment. This is really about reimagining what food means and how humanity can evolve towards a more conscious and sustainable way of living. It is plain to see how modern society is built on consumption. Consumption of resources, consumption of energy, and above all, food. Our current food systems are a major contributor to environmental degradation, including deforestation, water depletion, and greenhouse gas emissions. The global demand for food is only increasing. Putting immense pressure on agriculture systems that are already stretched to their limits. This over-reliance on physical sustenance is not only unsustainable, but also disconnects us from the deeper sources of energy that can sustain life. The pranic perspective challenges the very foundation of this consumption-based lifestyle. It asks us to consider, what if we could drastically reduce our dependence on physical food? What if we could tap into the boundless energy of the universe to sustain ourselves? This is not just some esoteric idea. 
but a transformative shift that could lead to a more harmonious relationship with our planet. Imagine a world where the reliance on agriculture becomes a bygone era, where food scarcity is no longer a pressing issue, and where people are more attuned to the energy within and around them. Pranic living offers a glimpse into such a future. By cultivating the ability to thrive on prana, the life force that permeates all things, we open up new possibilities for human existence. This doesn't mean that everyone will suddenly stop eating, but it does suggest that the role of food in our lives could dramatically shift. In this future, food becomes less of a necessity and more of a choice. A way to celebrate life rather than to sustain it. People might choose to eat for pleasure, social connection, or cultural tradition, but the constant need to consume would diminish. This would have profound implications for global food systems, reducing the strain on natural resources and decreasing the environmental impact of food production. Even for those who do not fully embrace pranic living, the principles behind it can guide us towards a more conscious relationship with food. Conscious eating is more is about more than just what we eat. It is about how we eat, why we eat, and the energy we bring to our meals. In a pranic world, conscious eating might look like this. Mindful consumption. Eating becomes a sacred act done with full awareness and gratitude. Every bite is savored and the energy of food is honored. This mindfulness can lead to a natural reduction in food intake as we put, become more attuned to what our bodies truly need. Sustainable choices. With a deeper connection to prana, people will feel less inclined to consume foods that harm the planet. Plant-based diets, locally sourced prod produce, and sustainable farming practices could become the norm as people prioritize foods that are in harmony with the earth. Energy over quantity. The focus shifts from quantity to quality, not just in the terms of nutrition, but in the energetic value of food. People might choose foods that are rich in life force, such as fresh fruits and vegetables, and avoid processed foods that lack vitality. Intermittent fasting and reduced meals. Intermittent fasting could become more widespread, not just for health benefits, but as a way to align with natural rhythms and enhance the body's ability to draw on pranic energy. Regular meals might become less frequent as people learn to sustain themselves with less. As we move towards a more pranic-based approach to nourishment, technology and innovation will likely play a key role. Imagine devices or technologies that help individuals harness pranic energy more effectively perhaps through enhanced breathwork techniques, meditation apps, or energy cultivation tools. And actually, fun fact, I, I actually started meditation from meditation apps. So there were two apps, Insight Timer and Headspace, back in 2017 that started me on the path of meditation. So it was actually through technology <laughs> that I learned to go deeper into myself and break myself out of certain paradigms that I was stuck in. But it's, oh wow, there we go, I say it right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm skipping ahead. I actually first discovered meditation through an app called Headspace and another called Insight Timer back in 2017. These innovations could support those on the path, making it more accessible to people who are just beginning to explore this way of life. Wow, thanks Jerome. <laughs> Additionally, Advances in quantum biology and energy medicine might provide more scientific validation for pranic living, offering insights into how the body can convert energy from the environment into sustenance. This could lead to a broader acceptance of pranic practices and a shift in how we think about human potential. The future of food and nourishment is not just about finding new ways to feed a growing population, it is about fundamentally rethinking 
what it means to be nourished. Pranic living invites us to consider a new paradigm where food is no longer the primary source of energy, but one of the many options available to us. In this future, nourishment comes from a deeper connection to the universe, a conscious relationship with our bodies, and an understanding of the energy that sustains all life. As we move into this new era, we have the opportunity to create a world that is more sustainable, harmonious, and in tune with the rhythms of nature. The Pranic Path offers a roadmap to this future, showing us that by expanding our understanding of nourishment, we can unlock new possibilities for mankind. Whether you choose to fully embrace Pranic living or simply incorporate its principles into your life, the message is clear. The future of food is not just about what we eat, but how we live. By tapping into the energy that surrounds us and lies within us, we can create a future where nourishment is abundant, sustainable, and aligned with the highest potential for humanity. And I think we'll go ahead and we'll take a stop there. We'll pause there. <laughs> Blessings to you, my friend. Thank you so much for listening again. These have been just a few more readings as we've been proceeding in this book here. People have been asking me to read Pranic Living Unveiled, A New Way of Nourishment. <laughs> and this book is available for you on Amazon in Kindle and physical book form. As product nourishment becomes the new norm, becoming the eye in the midst of the storm. Blessings to you, my friend. Thank you so much. Share this with someone who needs to hear it. Keep the grateful, thankful spirit. And if you'd like to learn more about chronic living, breatharianism, this lifestyle, check out the website that we have for you. It is called patreon.com slash chronic path with tons of audios, tons of videos, and several books for your listening, your auditory, and your reading pleasure. It is always a treasure. <laughs> and once again, for you, that website is called patreon.com slash chronic path. And stay in tune. We'll see you soon. May the rest of your life and the breath of your life be the best of your life. My friend, this has been Jerome Shaw. And we'll see you again. Take care.